Hello. Hey, everyone. Welcome. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing Tim Keeley today, who will be presenting a physio's guide to joint stability. Hailing from New Zealand, Tim has over 15 years' experience in physiotherapy and fitness. The principal physiotherapist and director of physio fitness, he is a re rehabilitation expert, clinical educator, and regular Phylex presenter. Tim specialises in sports, fitness, and training injuries, and has a passion for corrective exercise rehabilitation programs, as well as strengthening for lower back and lumbar disc injuries, shoulder pain, rotator cuff injuries, knee, patellofemoral, ACL, reconstructive surgeries, pretty much everything. <laughs> Please make Tim feel welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. All right, can everyone, can everyone hear me? Okay, great. Um, just uh, before we start, hands up who was in my session this morning. Gosh, okay, good. All right, some of the content, you'll go, oh, I saw that video before, but I'm going to bring it on again because we're going to talk about, like I said this, um, this morning, um, we were talking about injuries and how biomechanics they were happening, and now we're going to talk about joint stability and then what exercise we're going to use. So we're going to use some examples and get more in-depth about what exercises you should be using to create stable joints and how that all works. Um, just a little bit of background. Um, I work in a gym. I worked in a gym for basically my entire career. And throughout that time, we've done about, I've done at least 20,000, nearly 25,000 treatments. So in that time, we've just seen it's bread and butter is all about gym injuries and being able to stabilize people's joints and trying to work on getting the right exercises for these people right from the level of their, they're broken right up to the point where they're training as athletes. And it's been an awesome journey to see that happen. And so over the years, I've developed and fine-tuned every little exercise that we need to do to try and keep these joints stable. And today, I'm going to give you a guide um, of what I think is um, the most important things you need to go about joint stability. A little bit of housekeeping. Um, you'll see these videos um, today. Um, we are now putting everything on our YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. So if you just search for Physio Fitness, you'll find us. If you subscribe or like follow YouTube, you'll see every week we put up new stuff, whether it's treatments, um, injury demos, rehab exercises, stretches, all that sort of thing um, from our library we put up there and that'll mirror onto our website. So if you look at our website as well, you'll see that everything come through on the website as well. So just follow that. Um, another thing, there's a piece of paper floating around. Um, that's for you to register your interest. If you've not already done so, write your email down. I will um, email you the new version of this because the version you've printed out is wrong. So I will email you the new version. Plus, um, if you're interested in future workshops that we're gonna do throughout the year, write that email down and we'll contact you saying when they are on, okay? I have also need a physio for my practice. So if you guys know of any physios or you are a physio and you wanna work in Sydney with me, let me know. Okay, today, um, this is what we are going to cover in a nutshell. So trying to get you guys understanding how important it is to have stable joints when you are training and when you're exercising and what muscles are doing that stability and what is a stable joint, whether it's, you know, what the soft tissue rollers, what the capsule rollers, what the muscle rollers. And so you fully understand what you're trying to achieve and what muscles you need to be working on, not just your glutes. You know, someone says, oh, I've got weak glutes, I need to work on my glutes. Well, what does that mean? You know, there's not just one muscle in there and you need to know which muscles you're working. Um, we also talk about how people get unstable. You know, is it capsular? Is it because they have an injury? Is it because they've got weak muscles, uncoordinated muscles? What makes an unstable joint? Um, as well as what makes the body unstable. So you can have one joint that's unstable. You might have a shoulder dislocation and, and the glenohumeral joint is unstable. You might have two joints where the shoulder complex is unstable. So when they push and pull their scapular movement is not correct or, and, and their shoulder is not correct. They might have a weakness issue through rotator cuff and scapular stabilisation muscle, so the whole unit is unstable. Then they might be, have an unstable body when they squat. So again, that's multiple joints going through. Um, we'll talk about form versus force versus 
positional and explain the differences so you understand that there's different factors going on with how you actually create a stable joint. Um, like I said, training the right muscle groups, working out which exercises you need to be doing. Um, and then a little bit about, as we go through, we will cover over um, how this injury rehab that we're trying to achieve in a physiotherapy world needs to be put into practice in it as injury, injury prevention um, and learning about a little bit about motor control, repetition and, and how difficult tasks are and skill acquisitions. Because that's quite important when you're thinking about training movements. You know, if it takes about 10,000 repetitions to create a habit, you know, then you've got to do some sort of repetitions to create a good form. And if you're learning a new skill like, oh, I've got to do these exercises, well, how many times do you have to do them? And people ask me how many times I have to do these exercises to, you know, get my shoulder better. Well, I was probably around about 10,000. They could look at me as I'm crazy, yet they've got their Fitbit on and they did 10,000 steps today. So, you know, these things are all, all relative. So let's have a look at this. Why don't we break it down to factors of joint stability? And I like to think of it as three of them. So you've got form, which is your bone structure. All right, let's take the shoulder as an example. The shoulder's an amazing, amazing joint, and it's one of the most injured in training and in gyms. So we're going to look at that quite heavily, as well as the spine. Um, but the bone structure is where your form stability comes from and the capsule integrity. So in an unstable joint, you might have a fracture in that joint. That might be unstable. You might have a capsular tear in that joint. You might have a labral tear in that joint where the structure of the joint is no longer sound, 100%. What I mean by, if you know what a slap tear is, which is a labral tear, if, because, I'll put that down. If this is my socket of my scapula, now my socket sort of looks like that because it's not really a socket like my hip. My hip socket is like that. All right, it's a big bone, big socket, and it's got labrum capsule. My shoulder is a very shallow dish, so I've got a lot of play and a lot of movement. So I, to make up for the rest of that socket, I've got a big labrum, and I've got lots of connective tissue and soft tissue and lots of muscle control. Now, that shoulder, if there's a lot of play going on, a lot of shear forces going on, the labrum can rip away from the bone where it attaches. That creates an unstable joint. So the form part of that stability can be compromised through injury or just through repetition. Like people come with slap tears because they've just been doing lots and lots and lots of pressing. Now, I won't go too much into that because I'm not talking about how these injuries happen, but we're talking about the form part of stability, this capture integrity and mobility. Is it too sloppy in the joint? Okay, some things you can't control. If you've got a slap tear, you cannot, unless you have surgery, get that tighter. Right? If, you've had a, if you've had a shoulder dislocation and you've torn ligaments in the front 10 years ago and you've got an unstable joint, which you don't know about until you get assessed by the physio after you've had the injury. And it's the sort of things you can't see. You can't see whether your joint's unstable. It's really hard to work out. It just feels like, oh, it's a bit weak. It's, yeah, it's not quite as coordinated as this one, but I can still do this. But inside, that's why I talked about this morning, inside that joint, things are not moving correctly because it's not as snug or it's not held in the right position by the capsule and the bone and, and, the, and the, the socket. Right? The force part of it is where the muscles then wrap around and control the joint and keep it stable. Okay? And if you think about a knee, so my, my form closure, or my closure. My form stability is about whether my femur sits in my meniscus well, how tight are my ligaments, is everything working, so have I got an attacked ACL, and people with no ACL they've got too much movement, they're a bit unstable anterior immediately, so when they step in and roll they're just a little bit unstable, so that's the form. The force, you imagine, is the muscles over top, the strength that is coming in, quads, calves, hamstrings, that come in and support that joint, especially when the knee bends from flexion to extension, it needs to be stable all the way through that movement. The only thing that's doing that is muscles controlling the movement from flexion to extension and the co-contraction of those muscles. So that's really, really important, that form, force closure. And we can get that a lot better. This is the one we can affect 
quite well with training and with rehab is try to improve that strength, especially tendon strength, especially in rotator cuff problems where the tendon is actually weak, not necessarily the muscle, but the tendon is weak. Um, and then working on activation of these muscles, you know, firing glutes up, things like that, getting muscles working, getting them activated, improving motor control, right, so doing repetition and task movement. Um, and, of course, creation of torque. We're talking about torque as a big word at the moment, creation of torque to try and take a, create a state in the joint. For example, in a push-up, you're really trying to externally rotate when you push up. So you're trying to generate some torque and some force in that joint to keep that ball snug in the socket in the right position. Okay? So things we can really affect. And then positional, some things we can't affect internal that well, some things we can affect external. So the internal part of the position is that ball sitting in the socket? Is it getting sheared out of the socket? Or is it getting compressed into the socket? Okay, so how stable is it? For example, when I do a press move on the floor and I'm getting some compression through the socket versus a lift like this where I'm just getting straight shear movement. But if I've got a really strong rotator cuff, will it give me some compression and keep it snug in the joint? So things we can affect a little bit, um, but sometimes it's out of our control. Um, external is limb position and your technique. All right, so am I putting my joint through a stable position by doing this? Or is it more stable if I do that? And you're not thinking, well, you've got to be thinking, oh, it's not about, if you look at it, it's not just about where the elbows are, what is happening inside the joint when I do that? You almost got to have a bit of x-ray vision or 3D vision about, okay, if he's doing a push-up in this position versus this position, what is happening in the joint? When I go into here, is the ball, ball rolling forward? Okay, is it kept back in the joint? What's happening to it? Right? So you're choosing the correct position based on anatomy and what's happening in the joint and joint stability. Okay? So lots of things to think about. It gets a bit overwhelming at times because you just want to work on their form and keep them strong. But you've got to think about all these things when it comes to a stable joint or if you're trying to achieve a stable joint. If someone's unstable and you're trying to give them exercises to make them stable, this is the sort of stuff that's got to be floating around in the back of your head. Okay. So, we will get straight into it. We're well, going to go through four body parts. We're going to keep it short because we've only got now probably about 60 minutes. We've got four body parts. Shoulder, spine, hip, and knee. Basically, the four main things that I see get injured a lot, right? In training and gym and exercise, not necessarily sport. We're not going to go through sport injuries today because sport injuries a lot of the time happen due to not about training factors. There might be collisions, they might be spraining their ankle, they might be doing all sorts of things. So we're not going to talk about that. So shoulder, what I mean, you've got to think, shoulder is the glenohumeral joint. You've got to think about the scapula, you've got to think about the AC joint and the clavicle. Too far away, aren't I? And throughout this thing I'm going to show you some examples because it's very hard sometimes to visually think about what I'm saying without seeing a picture. Um, I touched on before, your shoulder is designed and built to be a very mobile joint. It's designed to do this. My hip doesn't have as much range of movement. Some people do if they're very flexible, but when you look at the anatomy, the hip is almost the same size as the shoulder as far as the ball, but the hip has got a way bigger bony socket because it needs to, because it needs to be more stable. The more bone around that, the more form stability I have, and I need that because I've got to land on that. Now if I did that to my shoulder, I'm not going to do that and jump up and down and land on one hand. Can you imagine what's going to happen to my shoulder? All right. So it's designed to be more stable through bone. All right. So the shoulder, when you load it heavily, you don't, you don't have as much form Street speed, so you have to make up it with muscular. You have to increase that. And a lot of the time, people are training the wrong muscle groups to create that joint stability. They might be stringing up delts and pecs and lats and traps, but they're forgetting about scapular stabilizers and rotator cuff. They might be doing a bit of a rotator cuff, but they're not 
doing it with scapular work. Okay. Um, so dislocations create massive amount of problems. Has anyone had dislocation here? A few. Okay, cool. What you've got to be asking your clients, if you're training clients, have they had a shoulder dislocation? Because I'll guarantee you they will not be perfect. Yep, and if they're training normal disciplines with an old shoulder dislocation that they've forgotten about, um, that's when you might run into trouble, and that's when they need to be assessed and see what is going on. Have they got the right stability? Because if they've lost, if they've got a little bit of too much joint play, you're going to have to really put into their program some joint stability rehab permanently to make sure they don't get injured. Um, the labrum integrity, I've just discovered that you know there's quite a few people now coming through the gyms that have slap tears, little minor ones, and they go for and then they. They don't get so they get a little bit better, they get about 80%, and we send them off for an MRI scan and they've got a, a slap tear in there. Now slap tear is where that labrum is getting ripped away, and they said, Well, nothing happened to me. I didn't fall over, I didn't dislocate my shoulder, just slowly started getting sore. And, you know, and we work out that they've been doing really high intensity exercises for the last eight months. Above head. Now, if you've got a shoulder that in the socket it sits quite well. But on one side, it's a bit unstable, meaning you don't have as much, say, rotator cuff control. So when they raise their arm above the head, they get a little bit too much elevation. It's okay, but for eight months doing that, you know, you think about, oh, they might get some impingement. They might get some rotator cuff impingement, some tendonitis, some swelling, that sort of thing. But also what happens is because the ball is riding up, it's reefing the labrum away from the socket. And you do that enough times, and it starts tearing away. Um, with the shoulder, there's compression forces which the joints sort of love, they get nice stability, that switches on muscles, and there's shear forces which you need lots of stability to handle. A shear force is a front raise. Okay, now the longer the lever and the heavier the weight, the worse the shear force is through that joint. Okay, so I have to have a really, really good engine back in here to try and handle this movement. To, if the heavier the weight, I have to really have an awesome rotator cuff and shoulder stability to handle and make sure that that ball sits in the socket perfectly because if it doesn't, it's going to start damaging structures and causing problems. Um, so when you think about the rotator cuff, you've got to think, oh, yeah, it does this, you know, it does rotation, you know, and it does this. Its primary role, primary role is not rotation. It's stability of the ball in the socket. And they all work together. So when you're doing external rotation, your internal rotators are working to control that movement. Okay, everything is working. And its main job is to keep that ball really stuck in the socket. Because when I guess what, when I press forward or pull back, my rotator cuff are not doing the primary movements. Okay, I've got pecs and anterior delts doing that, and I've got lats and rhomboids doing this. Now to have that movement absolutely perfect and have my shoulder stable inside the socket, when it does that, I have to have my rotator off going, Whoa, and just keeping it perfect on the way through. And if it doesn't, I'm going to be unstable in that joint. And this is where we get people with a bit of imbalance. They've got a strong rotator cuff, but stronger everything else. So when they press forward, there's like a mismatch in torque and mismatch in strength component going on there. So if you imagine, I've got big muscles attached to the arm bone. If I, if I press forward, my pec pulls that bone forward. And if I've got had no rotator cuff at all, my bone would just come forward, my ball would come out of the socket. So I need a rotator cuff to hold that in. Now, it's like a tug of war. When you see some guys, you know, you've got skinny guys on one side, big guys on the other, guess which way the rope's going to go. So if I press forward, I've got a massive pecs and pulling forward, and I've got a good rotator cuff, but it's not relatively, it's not as good then I'm going to get some shearing force through the joint and some instability in the joint and over time that will cause tissue failure. So the strongest people can still get problems and they go work on their shoulder strength without working on their stability. Um, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah, so if you... Yeah. Yeah, and we'll come to the bench press stuff in a minute too with the scapular work. But yes, if you had a weak rotator cuff, 
You sit up with a weak rotator cuff and a strong rotator cuff, that person, the strong one's going to bench press way more and get this injured too. Um, let's just digress here. Scapular stabilization. So, winging is a massive, massive thing in my world. And some of you have seen this before. For those you haven't, it's going to be another right now. Scapular winging is so damn important for shoulder stability. Yes. Can I, can I turn that up? I don't know. I'll give, I'll give it a shot. Not on there, I won't. How about I put it a bit higher? How about this? I'll put it up here. Is, is that better? Can you hear me now? Yes? Okay. Let's try this one. I'll do my button up. Um, scapular winging. So, can you see on that person there? That is scapular winging. There's a difference also right and left. So, it's not like the right one is winging and the left one is not. They're both winging. The right one is just worse. Okay? Now, this is what we call scapular stability. So you don't just think about the shoulder joint as this ball and socket. It is a complex of scapular and humerus. Okay, so if this is out, the scapula is not sitting right, there is no way that rotator cuff is in tip-top condition. Because it can't be. It can't be with an unstable base. Alright, so no matter how much you work on your rotator cuff to get its joint stability, if the scapula's out, you're never going to have correct movement. So with this person here, they are, if I look at your left shoulder, it's sitting like that. Now, if I make a socket, I turn around here, if I've got the ball in here, when this socket is supposed to be sitting like that, and the socket is now sitting like that, guess what's going to happen when I shoulder press? Okay, I'm going to get impingement. Okay, it's not going to be stable through there. It's not going to be a stable movement. Um, the right one is sitting like that, and it's sitting like that. You can sort of visualise the scapular bone underneath the muscle and, and skin there. It's sitting like that. Okay? No good, is it? Now that serratus anterior not working very well, it's lower traps not working very well, these is, this is usually more prevalent in people who are hypermobile. Hypermobile. They need way more muscle tone to hold a stable position than people who are hypomobile because they're, they're, everything's quite loose, so they need to have constant tone to keep everything sitting perfectly, especially through movement, where someone who's really tight has, can get away with it a little bit. They don't need as much muscle control to keep the joints stable because they're form closure is better. Someone who's hypermobile doesn't have as good form stability. They need to make it up with force stability to balance themselves out. Okay. And the next one is winging as well, but he's muscly and he's got some tone and you can't see it as much. But and we talked about this morning about he's got a scoliosis, he's got a fractured clavicle, and that's why he's having biomechanical problems. But this shoulder blade, if you can manage, if you can try and map it out, here's the border here like this. Okay, he is sitting like that. And you can't see it very well, but I can see it from my eyes because I can see this big lift through here. And you might think, oh, that's, he's muscular. It's the scapula coming up. Okay, that's what you're seeing the board. It shouldn't be like that. It should be flush. All right, so that's scapular wing. So you've got to have that sorted. And we'll go through some scapular exercises to, to counteract that. Um, and the last thing is, is lack of torque. So making sure you, know, you, you are creating a stable shoulder through correct Allocation of torque. Now, when you're doing shoulder rehab, so this is now getting here. That was the shoulder, unstable shoulder, scapula, connect humeral joint. What are we going to do about it? 
For joint stability, you need to start with closed chain exercises rather than open chain. Closed chain gives you compressive forces, it generates easier to do for the joint. Um, if there's less taxing on the joint, you're going to be, do better at creating and firing up muscles that need to be stabilized, that need to be worked. Open chain, you then progress to down the track once you've got the stability. And you usually go from proximal stability to distal stability. So when you're going, I've got an unstable shoulder complex, it's scapula first, rotator cuff second. Okay? Don't go away and start doing this sort of thing when your shoulder weight's sitting in a winged position like this. Okay? And people go, oh, your shoulder's forward, pull it back. So they pull it back, but it's still winging because they haven't worked on their scapular stabilizers. Okay, so always scapular first. Don't start using dumbbells, that's for strength. Start using bands. Okay, it's much better to use bands when you're doing exercises of the shoulder. I need to I'll stop walking away. Remember, all these exercises building the building phase. It's not about athletic performance. Okay, this is building people up to get a stable joint, not to build an amazing, strong shoulder. All right? Um, so, your selection process, this is probably what you've been looking for. This is the order I would put it in from a physio point of view of what you should be trying to, exercises you should be trying to do. The red ones I'll show you in a video. Scapular press, okay, so that's a press against the wall where you're just moving the shoulder blade forward and back. We are going, we're protracting forward because that is what serratus does. Serratus protracts. It also is the only muscle that is going to keep that shoulder blade from winging most of the time. It flattens it. So we have to go into protraction to make a flat shoulder blade, not retraction. Retraction is the complete opposite and makes it worse. Um, you'd go from one arm, you go from, you do one arm thing on the wall, one arm on the floor, one arm against the ball. It's a scapular press, I'll show you that in a minute. Then you move to an arm raise, meaning you're on all fours into this position and you raise one arm. Okay, so I'm training the one that's on the ground. All right, so I've learned how to protract. So I go into my protraction position, I'll show you on this side, and I hold it there. And that's creating switching on muscles that stabilize the shoulder complex. Okay, it's generating isometric contraction control. And if you do it properly, it's really, really hard. And most people do it poorly. They'll be in this four point position, raise their arm and sag into contraction, which is what you don't want. You've got to keep to keep that stable position. But when they're in that position, they've got to create some torque. Externally rotate into the shoulder. Not sit there in internal rotation. With sort of bone on bone. Um, then moving to an arm leg raise. You've seen this all before, you know, this one here. Okay, but make sure they're doing that absolutely correctly. Right, they don't shift back onto their knee. I mean, there's lots of things you need to go through with all these exercises. And I won't bore you to tears with how you break down each exercise. You can look on our YouTube for all that. Um, but I, what I'm explaining to you is this is the positioning why we're doing it. We need to create scapular stability first and it needs to be easy and then it needs to build up. So that's your pressing stuff, that serratus work. And that's primary, that is the massive main focus. The first thing you should be thinking about is how do I get that person's serratus anterior better and scapular stability better in a protracted position to stop that winging. Next is your one-arm row. Now, your one-arm row is just getting their pull movement better. And that, what I mean by this is when people pull, row, lat pull down, chin up, say it's a pull movement, right? They need to make sure that they pull back, we all know this, or attract back, and they come through here, and when they get to here, they don't lose it. And it's hard to spot sometimes. Or they bend their elbows, before they've actually retracted. So they'll go, that movement, and if you slow it right down, they've done this movement, and you've really got to watch that. 
All right, so making sure when you're doing these exercises, this is the sequence, but you've got to be doing them correctly. And we're doing that to get their, their movement pattern correct so you're creating a stable joint through range. Yeah? And yes, it works on retractors and all that sort of thing, but it's getting a stable joint through range. Then you'd go into a press movement to try and get their push up and their bench press and any sort of pressing movement. So you add in, you've got your scapular press here, now you're adding the arm as well and making sure that movement is correct. So when they're in a push up, that they do retract and come through and then try and make sure they really come up and then go back into the right position again. Right. Band rotations is next. So we're down to now the glenohumeral joint. And it's open chain when we get to this point because we've worked on our closed chain stuff. Um, I would always start down in zero. Okay, now you remember the most important is external rotation. Now, when people are injured and they've got specific problems, they'll do internal rotation as well. But if you're going to break down what is most important, external is most important. Okay, so this movement here, all right, and people are doing this all the time. Now, you're going to learn nothing if you keep the elbow locked in by your side and start doing this. I'm just holding it because I'm not attached to anything else. But if I was, it would be over there somewhere. Right? You've got to keep it out in space. So you've got to teach the body, when I do external rotation, I also want to keep that ball in the socket centred. If I lock in here, my rotator cuff doesn't need to do its primary function, which is stability of the joint. My stability is here. I've just locked it in here. All I'm doing is external rotation. Now that's fine. It's going to build up your external rotators, but it's not going to teach them how to then keep external rotation when I don't have my arm by my side. So when I do a press, I need to be able to have keep external rotation in here, not dive inwards through the joint. Okay. So when I press forward, I don't I don't roll in like that. So very important that you work on that, and very important you go from zero degrees to 45 degrees. And when I do 45 degrees, I tend to turn to go this way and pull back like in that angle, because that is a training position, pushing and pulling in that sort of 45 degree angle, push-ups, bench press, whatever you want to do, chin-ups, that 45 degree position, you've got to be strong in there. There's a big difference between strong here and strong here. It's a lot easier to be strong down here. Up here, you're engaging a lot more rotator cuff work, so it's harder. Uh, and oscillation work, that gets down the track as well. The other thing is overhead. So we're all doing stuff down here, that's great, but you've still got to rehab them and get stability above head. And that's hard. Because as soon as that arm goes you know, down here, your shoulder, is, you can keep it relatively stable. If you go up here, you've got to then control winging and induction and all sorts of things and elevation of the shoulder. Is that because that shoulder sits down, the shoulder blade sits down here when you're doing this, sits down here when you're doing this, that's great. Okay? But to try and get an arm over here, I've got to abduct, rotate, and elevate. And get my ball and my socket perfect all the way up. So when I go from this position to this position, there has to be a perfect unison between the scapula and the shoulder. So before I get over here, I've got to have everything working well. I've got to get all that stability working well before I even get to that point. And if someone's got an unstable joint, they probably shouldn't be going over here, up into here, under load, because they will just run into problems. So let me show you some, some examples of what I mean for these exercises, so you can understand what I'm talking about. Sorry, this should have all been up. If it's going to work today. Good old computers. Oh, there we go. Okay. Here I am with this scapular press stuff. Okay, this is four point. Okay, working on protraction, retraction, getting that person, making sure they can actually dive into retraction there and then come up. That's protraction, obviously. Okay, that's your scapular stuff to try and prevent that winging. Very boring exercise. 
crazy boring, but you'd be surprised how many people can't do that. And it's what needs to be done when you're doing a push-up. Not necessarily a heavy bench press, you need to stay of attraction, but you know, how you go to promote psoriasis and tear activation, this is how you do it, to get that wing, to get that shoulder more stable, so they don't sit in wing when they are attracted in a bench press. They sit in neutral. So that's the sort of stuff you've got to work on. Um, the one arm press against the wall. These are all on our website, by the way. Gosh, if it goes fast enough. There's your one arm press against the wall, right? So working on trying to get forward and back movement going well and watching whether they're winging or not. Making sure that shoulder blade comes back into attraction and then protracts forward. This should be a staple exercise for people with scapular instability or winging. All right, as long as they can get to this point. Right, you may find they have to do something on the floor first. Shame these aren't. Come on. I think someone needs to restart my computer. Okay, one arm row. So, thinking about when they pull back. So now the first part, sometimes when people, they just don't have the synchronization between pulling backwards and getting their humeral working correctly, they need to just work on just scapular attraction and work on how they do it. They're always pulling and they, they don't retract. They've got to work on the scapular movement here. Some people are so stiff in there, they don't have that correct movement but you've got to make sure they retract properly and don't elevate. So that position first, then they go into a full pull, um, making sure that they don't roll that ball forward. Okay, so this is training a little bit of that motor control, which gives you stability. The motor control component also strengthens you up, obviously, but it's very important that you are working, these, part of these exercises is improving their form and technique of that movement, which gives them more stability because the muscles are getting trained to control the movement, which gives them joint stability. Okay? It's not just about getting the muscles strong. You have to also teach that joint how to move, just like you would in golf or tennis or rugby or anything like that. Right? It's not good enough just trying to keep good technique and trying to use a mirror. Okay? They need to be instructed and do these exercises to improve that movement patterning, hundreds of thousands of repetitions, so when they go into load, they're awesome and they do the right movement patterns all the time. Hence creating a stable joint. The overhead one, when I saw about overhead abduction, is this one. Now, the band, some of you might not have seen this before. The band is creating a abduction resistance, ad, 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 adduction resistance. It's also assisting the lift. So it's helping control the movement because a lot of people don't have the correct control. This is going to help assist their control. So when I pull down, I've got to make sure my shoulder blade is coming down as I pull down. Okay, it doesn't get left hung up in the air like that. This is very important when you see people pull down or do chin-ups, they can't keep the first movement here, they leave their shoulders up in the air. Okay, they've got to pull down here and then pull through as they go, but at the same time when they come up, it needs to stay down. And this exercise works on your adductors and your control mechanisms in your scapula to control that movement. Because doing a chin up is not gonna teach that person how to create a stable joint. It's gonna get strong muscles, but it's not gonna actually teach that movement pattern. This is where you've gotta break it down into these type of exercises and work on getting that person thinking about and being mindful about what is happening in that shoulder. And you need to know your anatomy as far as where that shoulder needs to sit and when it needs to rise and rotate and how much it needs to abduct. Okay, so that's a really good exercise that's down the track for your rotator cuff and scapular control. And we give that one quite a bit. 
All right. Let's move on. So that's your shoulder. Any questions on the shoulder? You're all like, yes. It's just so the band doesn't hit my nose. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, but remember, you don't have to be, you don't have to be here, okay? This is a nice, plain movement for the joint. It's awesome, okay, that nice neutral movement through, they call it scaption through here. Okay, that's great. And remember, we don't lift bags like this. Okay, we lift them out, we lift them in front. Okay, so that's fine. It's when it gets to here, there's a bit of a problem. So this part is a nice step because you can generate some torque. It's good out here. Okay, but so don't, don't worry too much about that. All good. Okay. Spine. Probably stuff you've been waiting for. Okay. Now, spine is another massive one because, you know, in our clinic we see shoulder injuries, knee injuries, spinal injuries, okay, from training, from exercise. And there's a lot to think about when you're dealing with the spine because there's a hell of a lot of joints in there as well. We're going to talk about mostly the bottom five, all right, your lumbar, because that's what gets the most under load. When you think about your spinal and disc vertebrae, okay, again, we're talking about form closure, all right? I've got vertebrae and discs and all that sort of thing, and they're designed to bend and move and you give me mobility and give me stability, but it's the little muscles around the spine and the internal corset muscles we've got to really be thinking about when we get a muscle stability, bad word, muscle strength to create joint stability. Remember, if, don't let anyone tell you there's muscle stability, there's no such thing. It's muscle strength creating joint stability. Um, how, what's the disc integrity like? Have they got a bulging disc? That'll create a joint, joint instability because it's not as stable because there's a bulging disc in there. Okay? Has the disc lost height? Is it an old disc? Is it an old injury that is now a lost height disc? Okay, so they're not as stable around that joint. They'll have some weakness around it because the disc is not as good. So your little muscles that control that and give it that force closure are not as good. They'll be a little bit unstable. You can have massive problems like spondylolisthesis, which is real instability where one bone is sitting forward. Okay, or retro is sitting back. You know, the, the big problems going on here. You can have other things like where you've got wear and tear. Okay, they're unstable because they've got wear and tear around the bone. Um, lots of important things to think about. And again, these are the things you can't see. You might put up a scan and you go, well, what does that mean, you know? Well, it may mean that they've got instability in the spine. And you think, instability? Well, they're all, you know, well, very good. Yeah, no, it's unstable because it's not being held together amazingly well when they load and squat. Um, and you've got to understand your multifidus and your TA role. Your multifidus helps stabilise each little segment and works together to give you a long stability as well. And it works with your TA, which creates that force closure around the spine and keeps it from breaking in half or bending forward when I've got 100 kilos on my back. All right? So the stronger I have my TA and the better it activates, the better it switches on and the more I can recruit it, the more my brain is working on TA and multifidus. When I squat, the more stable I am, the more load I can put on. Why do you think people put on weight belts? Did anyone see that lifting comp in the expo today? Okay, now weight belts are absolutely fine. He had 225 kilos on his back. I'd have a weight belt too. They need that because they need to create more force closure around the spine. The TA is not going to do that. It's not, going to, it's not strong enough to handle 200 kilos on my back without getting injured. Okay, so they need that weight belt. And it's absolutely fine when it's massively heavy like that. Okay, it's what it's for. It's to create more than what the body can handle because he's trying to do a heavy lift because that's the sport, right? It's when you have a weight belt when you're only lifting a little bit is a bit funny or using a weight belt because you're, you've got a bad back. And that's terrible, okay? You shouldn't be using a weight belt because you've got a bad back. You should be strengthening up your core, okay? So he probably has got an amazing core, right? And everything's working. It's just that he's got a massive load on. So you need reinforcement, okay? You're just reinforcing it. Um, 
your pelvic floor, that is part of your stability for your spine. Okay, it's not. It's still not done well. All right. So lifting up the pelvic floor to generate transverse abdominis activation, that automatic activation gives you that spinal stability, that inner unit spinal stability, and then you tack on lumbar extensors and QL, and you tack on internal oblique, you tack on your rectus, you tack on your hip flexors, you tack on your glutes, and there's your massive stability. But if you have all that on and you don't have anything internally, the spine is still unstable inside. And as soon as you take a breath in, guess what's going to happen? Okay, there's a lot of shear forces go through that spine because nothing's holding it that well together. Well, the forces from the outside are strong, and if you don't have an internal force closure from the internal muscles, you're going to get shear forces through the spine. So you've got to be unstable, okay? Especially if they move. Um, loss of spine. So when you talk about, you've got joint instability, when you talk about body instability, okay, body movement, where they, remember, you can be unstable in a position because you're going to extension. Okay, it's not, you're not holding a stable spine. Okay, so that loss of neutral, whether it be a loss of neutral deflection, whether it be a loss of neutral and extension, it's a loss of neutral. Whether it be this way, okay, are they shifting this way? Have they got a scoliosis in there? Okay, this goes back to form. You know, have they actually, it's not as a technique, but as in form as in the bones, have they got actual uh, shape, a scoliosis in there? thoracic lumbar junction, and they can't hold a neutral spine in this direction, okay? So that will give them a loss of spinal stability. That's what we've got to try and either correct or be mindful of um, either way. Hypermobility. So someone's got a really bendy back, what do they need? They need more force closure to create that stability because they don't have the form stability as much as, say, I have, okay? Um, we talk about in our outer core, right? And spinal position, okay? So are they doing the right things with their hips and their spine? I know you squat a lot, but it's, you know, that's the one that gets injured the most. People squatting and deadlifting, that's when they get their binge their back, okay? Are they working out dissociation of their hip versus their spine? Are they stable in their spine enough, okay? when they squat down. If they're unstable, or if they say they're tight in their hip, say they've got a hip mobility problem, and the hip is tighter than how stable their spine is, the spine's gonna give first. Okay, so say they go to a squat, and I start, my hip's getting tighter and tighter and tighter, just forces me into extension. Okay, because I've got too much stiffness through the joint. Okay, in the front. Or if I've got too much stiffness in my posterior part, it'll just run me into flexion when I drop down. I'll do that butt winking thing that you see. Okay? So really important stuff. Let's have a look at the spine, just so you've got that discontinuity and see if I can burn this into your brain. This is just about all types of spinal disc problems you can have. Normal at the top. Juicy, looking great. I imagine it's a car tire on its side. Think of the car tire as, you know, the outside of the disc is the, is the tread. Think of inside the disc as full of toothpaste, if you like. The generated disc is the next one down. Okay, so you might have cracks through the tread. Fissures and cracks and tears in the annulus wall. It can't hold the weight of the car as well. It bulges a little bit because the wall integrity is not good. All right, so you've got less integrity, less stable. Okay, if I jump up and down on it, it's not going to be as stable at that level. Bulging out the back. Who's got disc bulging here? Okay, one, two. That's not many in this class. It's good. Um, herniated disc, blind right out. I mean, that's not a great picture, but anyhow. Okay, when you've got a client that's got a herniated disc, and it might be now, it might be ages ago, they are definitely not going to be stable at that level as much as the other levels. So it's that intersegmental instability. Do you think the multifidus and rotorius muscles at that level will be magic compared to the level above? Of course not. Okay? They're not going to be. And do you reckon they would have strengthened them up and gone and got them isolated and worked on that? Probably not. Okay? 
thinning of the disc. So when a disc goes from a herniated disc and it blows out, you lose that nucleus. It doesn't just remake some more nucleus. It'll seal up. But you go re-MRI that, and we've done that with people. You re-MRI them. It is now half the height. Okay, so it has lost some of that shock-absorbing ability. It's not going to be as stable, and there's going to be weakness around that region. And with multifidus, because they're segmentally innervated, you can have weakness just at one level, which creates a massive problem, because to strengthen up one level is really difficult. Um, and then degeneration. Now, when they get to this point here, sometimes they're so stiff they're really stable. <laughs> because they're not moving too much. So they've actually got a bit of form stability back, but they just don't. Then they, They're not strong, and they don't move. All right, so when they're really stiff, and this can happen um, when you, in the elderly, of course. Okay, it's a natural process, remember, to degeneration. Um, they can be, have almost more joint stability, but geez, they've got a lot of weakness, and they can't lift much, and they don't bend very well. They might have quite a bit of pain with it. Okay. All right, so just see if you can remember that one. It's a good one to Google that. It's everywhere all over now. So what are we going to do with spinal rehab? You cannot work on glutes and form in a squat to maintain a stable spine without working on your inner core and breathing. Okay, it's inner core which is pelvic floor and TA first, getting your breathing correct, then it's your hip, then it's your outer core. Okay. So you've got to work on your breathing, you've got to work on your TA, you've got to work on your whatever, get that absolutely perfect. Then you've got to work on your glutes that are lazy. Then you can focus on let's get your obliques better, let's get your rectus abdominis better. Okay. Not the other way around. Um, breathing and breath holding. So people who breath hold under load sometimes do it to create a lot of pressure build up to get their spine stable because their TA is not so great. Okay? The people who are doing 200 kilo lifts will breath hold. That is normal. Right? But you shouldn't be doing that when you're just doing normal body weight squats. You know, like, uh, 20 kilos. It's a bad way of patterning because if they're promoting that quite a bit, they're going to be doing it in everyday life. You need to be making sure that they breathe out and lift the pelvic floor, okay, when they breathe out. Now, what we're teaching at the moment is activation, so they will breathe out, lift their pelvic floor, which is like holding a wee to activate their, their, rectus, uh, their transverse abdominis. Then we make sure they can do that and hold it on and keep breathing through 10 repetitions of a squat. So rather than you going and letting everything go under load and then switching on it, and breathing out, bring it on, get it to that nice 30% level, get their breathing right so they've got it on and they're breathing, and then they go through their squat. And yes, you can breathe in on the way down and breathe out on the way up, but your TA, your pelvic floor is on the whole time to continually have a transverse abdominus activation to keep that spine stable when they are under load, and then you tack on bracing on top of that when the load is heavy. Bracing, I mean by obliques and rectus and QR and extensors and all that sort of stuff. Okay. So, your selection process. Pelvic floor, okay. On your back, breathing, lifting up, letting it go. This is what we do in physio. Then teach them in four point, then teach them in standing, then teach them when they squat. Um, a neutral spine. The TA breathing one. I'm going to show you, this is really hard to show people pelvic floor lifting because we can't see it, right? But what I'm going to show you, what you can look for, and you can obviously feel it, and if you've been taught some pelvic floors, you can feel that TA switching on. I want you to make sure, though, when you see that, the, this is what you need to be looking for. Now, if I can get, I think it's this one. This patient here is an awesome patient of mine. She's lovely. She's had a spinal fusion. She fell down. If you watch the video on our YouTube, she fell through. A, you know, they're renovating, and there's a hole in the floor which was covered, and she fell through that because she 
went upstairs, to, I think, to check out the renovations and went straight through. Fell six metres, three metres, three metres, it's a long way, onto her back and fractured her L1 into about 30 bits. All right, straight to hospital. And the surgeon, I think she spent uh, a week in there getting operated on because they had to take out all the little bits away from her spinal cord and all sorts of stuff. They put in a cage system in her spine between L2 and T12 to fuse the semen together because the bone was so shattered, they had to put a like a, a metal casing in there and join the two bones together and then you basically make one big block. So she's fused in that segment. But you imagine the core shut down around that. She couldn't move, it was terrible. She's now doing really well. And when she brings on her TA, her belly button, which way should her belly button go? Does anyone know? In, yeah, and south. Yeah, okay, not up. If your belly button, I'll show you this one. She going? Am I running out of? Oh, that should be working. Slow computers, eh? Sorry, guys. Annoying, isn't it? <coughs> Anyhow, I'll let that recoup. So when you bring on your pelvic floor, your belly button should go yes, in, and south. Okay, you'll see it sort of dive downwards. If it's going upwards, they're not recruiting their pelvic floor correctly. So try not to use the, I don't like using the thing where you try and draw your belly button to your spine because they usually bring it up. They usually, they usually do that. Okay, they try and bring it in by lifting up for what they're good at, what they're strong at, and forget about what's going on down here. Okay? So holding a wee is the best because that's coming from down below. So if you think it's coming from down below, you think it's going to go south, isn't it? So when you see that go in and down, you're doing the right thing. Okay? Hopefully. There we go. Um, your multifidus one. Now... This is where things get through tricky. Multifidus in your spine. Now, you guys can actually do this. If you put your hands either side of your spine, so you join your thumbs together, you'll find your spinous processes there. Come down until you're sort of almost around the lowest one, above your PSIS, if you can remember all your anatomy. Come above your PSIS. There's your center spine. Just come just either side of it. Okay, now. What I want you to do is dig your thumbs in, okay, and see if you can have that spine relaxed a little bit, okay, not too all tense, dig your, dig your thumbs in until they're sort of stuck in there like that. What I want you to do now is breathe out and lift your pelvic floor for me and tell me which one of you guys feels tone in those muscles and they pop out against your thumbs. <laughs> Good, because you're standing, brilliant. All right. You probably don't feel it yet. What I want you to do now is think about breathing out, lifting that pelvic floor up so you're holding a wee, and then I want you to see if you can tighten those muscles where your thumbs are. Can you do that subconsciously? Can you tighten those muscles without extending your lower back? Yeah, you feel that? Okay. That is your multiverse. Now, with some people, they go, I don't know what you're talking about. I, I, I can't do that. And so they might not have a very good connection between brain and multivis. It might come on demand when they stand and go, oh, there it is, I can feel it now. And you may find when you're standing, when you're more of a neutral spine, you can really bring it on and tighten it. Okay, do you want to try that? Have a stand up. So, thumbs in here again. Thumbs on your spinous processes. Come to the gutter, so either side, dig in. Now, Make sure you're in neutral spine, so you can't be standing in extension. You've got to be in neutral spine. Breathe out, lift that pelvic floor, and then tighten the muscles where your thumbs are. Have you got it now? You feel that sort of bounce out a little bit? You may have to pull on your pelvic floor quite a bit. 
don't go and extend your back because that's extensors. Now you should be able to tighten and if you don't, you may have a really poor connection with your head here or you've got a really weak multifidus. Okay? And that's what we're trying to do. That little muscle bounces out and stabilizes so it switches on. All right? Now if you're not thinking about that, it's probably not working very well when you squat and when you deadlift and all that sort of thing. Okay? But it should come on with that TA and if it doesn't, it's probably a little bit weak or it's not very coordinated. Okay? You'll see it bounce out here. If I can get this one going. <sighs> How annoying. Oh. All right, we'll just wait for a little bit. Um, but trying to work on your TA multifus first, okay, and get that working. I would do that in prone for your multivitus, then in four point. Because in prone, you can feel what's going on. In four point, you can't. It's just got one hand behind your back sort of thing. Okay? So once they've got that working there, yes, then they can do it in four point, which is even better. Then they start, need to start working on, can I then move my leg and keep it on? Not let it shut off and not lose my extension. Right? So we're training the spine to be in a stable position when I move my limbs. This is what we need when we squat and when we move. Okay? So very important to do that way as well. Um, if I can just bring this working. Sorry, guys, this is really annoying. There we go. Okay, we'll come back to it. Um, so, TA breathing, once you've got that working, and listen, sometimes it requires people going to the physio to get this hands on stuff, but what I'm trying to explain to you today is. This is how it needs to work, okay? You can't do high-level core stuff to get these muscles working. They need to be boring and they need to be low, and they need to be done a lot. Um, leg float, this is getting into clinical Pilates type stuff. Leg float, leg raise, and fallout. So when they do a leg float, if you know what a leg float is, it's, you can watch me, that position, okay? What they're doing is they're creating a low demand on your transverse abdominis to keep that pelvis stable. Okay, so when I raise my leg, I don't want my pelvis doing that. So it's just creating a little bit of demand. Can I keep it stable if I'm on my back and float my leg up and bring it neck down and not let myself extend and not let myself flex? Because that's what I've got to do when I squat. It's the same movement, that and that. The hip and the spine is the same. Now, if I'm doing this and bending my spine, guess what I'm doing when I do that? So it's teaching you to keep a stable spine under low load so you can actually do it and concentrate on it because it's, hard, it's too hard to do it in a squat. All you've got to think about in a squat is just keep your spine neutral, keep good form. But to train it and train yourself to do that and to train the little muscles to do it, you've got to unload yourself. And that's why they do it on the floor. That's why they do this clinical Pilates work because that's the best way of teaching it. Um, so they might slide the leg, they might extend, they might bring two legs up and one. Basically creating more and more and more load demand. It's harder, harder, harder. Um, the leg raise in prone, okay, so doing, trying to keep a neutral spine and doing this sort of movement. Okay, go from there to there and then one arm as well. Okay, creating more demand on the whole system to keep a stable spine. Um, fallouts is your so we're all going this way. When you do a knee fallout, it's that making sure the pelvis doesn't rotate this way either. So like if you go into a lateral lunge, making sure you're not losing stability there. Okay? Lots of stuff to think about. Let's move on to the hip. Now the hip is a joint of a lot of YouTubing at the moment. A lot about mobility of the hip and how the hip is a lot to do with why people get injured because they're not mobile enough on the hip okay and that's great because a lot of the time that is the case you know people are very stiff through the hips they don't have enough range in their hips so when they squat they run out of range and they 
start moving their back and they become unstable. So the hip has got a lot to do with the back stuff. But we also got to talk about the stability of the hip. Now, the hip is different to the shoulder. It's got more stability. It's going, yay, we've got more stability because it's got more bone. All right, so that's a more stable joint. But it, it can also move that joint. Okay, you can also get impingement of the front of the joint, have acetabulum impingement. You can have capsular restriction through the joint, which basically when they squat, it means that they run out of range or the joint actually move, the ball actually moves in the socket incorrectly and gets rammed in the joint. Okay, so you still have similar problems. Um, but what you've got to think about, therefore, is there's a few mobility joint issues as far as it not centering the socket, but on most of the problem, of stability is the force stability of the joint. And this is another one where we don't see our bum very much, so we don't pay attention to it. And when people talk about their lazy glutes, don't run and fall into the trap, oh, I've got lazy glutes, okay, yeah, my glutes. And they're thinking when it's the lay person, when they don't understand anatomy, they think there's one muscle there. My glutes, my bum. There's yeah. one muscle, that's all they feel. It's just one mass, one muscle. You've got six lateral rotators. Okay, you've got glute medius, you've got glute minimus, and you've got glute maximus, and that's just the back. Then you've got your psoas, and you've got your adductors. It's out of control with it. It is a crazy joint. There's so many muscles around it, and so much force closure around it, because it needs to be, because I've got to do this. All right? And I've got to move and dart and all that sort of thing. So you need to understand how your hip muscles work in order to train them to get them better and not just, oh, I've got to work on my glutes. Because, you know, well, which glute are you talking about? Are you talking about glute med and min, or are you talking about glute max? Or are you actually talking about the lateral rotators? Because if someone says to you, oh, yeah, when I lunge, listen, my knee rolls and my glutes are weak. Well, actually, that's your lateral rotators, which are really deep. That's not your glutes. Okay, your glute med and min do internal rotation and hip stability. So if your knees are internally rotating, that's not weakness in your glute med. If your hip's dropping, it is. Okay, but it's just that. It's your lateral rotators, which is, there's six of them. All right? So, pelvic drop and internal rotation is instability of the hip. So, when I go, oh, that movement there. And you see people doing this. They'll try and do a one-legged squat, and they'll do that. Okay? Now, that happens in sport. Okay, we dive and we do this sort of stuff, and that's normal. You know, pick up a ball, that's great. We need to have hip range, and we need to be able to go into internal rotation, that's great. But when you are training under load to create strength, there's no point training like this. Okay? And remember, we're not doing athletic performance. We're not doing drills to improve how well they control their valgus and internal rotation when they go and pick up a ball or they do a tennis shot. All right? We're training in this position to keep them stable and generate strength in this position. All right? So... When they do pelvic drop and internal rotation, you've got to be thinking their internal rotation is weakness in their lateral rotators. Okay? But usually combined with that, they have pelvic drop as well. And that's their glute medium. So you need to package that up. So when you're doing a one legged squat, like a step down or something like that, you're controlling, you're focusing on is my knee keeping stable in that position? Am I making sure it's not internal rotating? It's, it's, if anything, it's, you're trying to externally rotate it to keep it in neutral. And you've got to keep your pelvis level, which is your glute medium. So the external rotators and the internal rotators co-contract, and there's your stability. It is no different to the rotator cuff, internal rotators, and external rotators co-contracting to generate joint stability. Okay, when we talked about the primary role of the rotator cuff was to stabilise the joint and all work as a unit. Guess what happens when you do one good squat? Do you think... External rotators are working and internal rotators are not. They all work together to create a stable joint. So you can break it down, do external rotation work, which is fine, or more, you know, clams and that sort of thing. But when you get down the track, you've also got to think about the joint, hip joint as a unit. And so you might do co-contraction work. All right? So that's where you're making sure you are, you know, what you think, how do I do co-contraction work? Well, you can do external rotation work with a band, and you can make sure your pelvis is up here because if you think about what your glute med and mind are, they're internal rotators, but they also, if you contract this way, they do that. Okay, so they are working. Right? And you can put a band around the other way if you want to as well. 
Okay, but that's pretty hard. Most people put the band this way. Because okay, most of the problem is your knee rolling in, not your pelvis dropping. Um, and then position, you've got to make sure, like, if I'm in this position here, if, I'm, if my foot position is incorrect, okay, it's, to, it's in or it's out, I'm not going to be able to create good enough torque or stability in that joint. Okay, we don't walk, well, you shouldn't walk like this, and you shouldn't walk like that. You should walk straight. Okay, and that's what the joint's designed to do. So when you go into a squat, guess what? That's where you've got to be too. Okay, not like this. Definitely not like that. All right? And a little bit about SIJ. Um, again, the SIJ is a joint that sits almost like your knuckles. So you've got to think of the SIJ, it sits like that. Okay, so there's a lot of form closure in there. It's you know, a pretty solid joint. It does move though, but things like the glute, Max comes over and contracts and keeps that force closure. So if you don't have a good system, a posterior train sling going on over that SIJ, you're going to get instability in the SIJ. Right? The problem arises, say, when someone is pregnant, and they get a lot of relax, and that SIJ loses its form closure because the ligaments start getting too loose and they start getting shearing work. And this is where people get SIJ problems if they're pregnant if they stand on one hip because they're reefing one side and their body's getting slowly and slowly looser with the relaxant. And they end up with an unstable sacred egg joint. And they need to be stabilized with a belt. You've seen those SIJ belts to generate, you know, they've got a baby here and they're not going to exactly be able to do heaps of glute work. You know, if they've got their 34 weeks pregnant, they need a belt to create that form closure. It's like a weight belt, right? But it's to keep the bones together while they get through this pregnancy. Okay, so exercises for that. Well, just just touch on that. This one again, burn this into your brain. Here's my laser. Glute max is even on there. Well, sorry, here it is, coming over the top. We've taken that away, okay? Under glute max, but you can still see from the top, there's your glute med, they've cut a little bit of that way, so it's there, okay? Glute med is underneath it. Now, these two, internally rotated, because they're sitting on that side of the bone. They, they're internal rotators, they do that, okay? But when you're standing on one leg, their function is all quite different. They lift up and keep your pelvis level. They're the ones, when I walk as a human, when I plant my foot on my right, they're the ones that are going to switch on so I can lift my pelvis so I don't clip my foot on the ground. Pretty simple mechanics. And if I don't have that, I'll go. And you see this in what they call a Trendelenburg gait. Have you ever heard of Trendelenburg gait? And that's this movement here. And this happens in arthritic hips, who have just done no rehab, and they've lost all their glute med because of the arthritis, generating pain, switching that muscle off and completely just turning it off. What happens is, because they drop like this, they're going to clip their ground. They're going to clip their foot, aren't they? Because they can't lift their hip, because they've got no strength. So they go like that. So they use their spine, and they don't know they're doing it, but the body's that clever compensation patterning. So they plant their foot, drop their hip, lift their spine. So you, this. And you see these people getting around with this, arthritic hips, because it's a lack of glute meat and men not doing their job. Right? There's your rotators here. Piriformis is a clever muscle. It's a bit of a dual one. It's an abductor, and it's a low rotator. It's very clever. All right? So think of glute medium men as your real stability role is abduction of the hip. Okay, they do internal rotation well, but abduction. Whether it's this way, that movement there is the same as that movement there, isn't it? It's just one's closed chain and that's open chain. Same movement. All right, and you wonder why people when Pilates are doing side-lying leg raises for glute, because they are doing abduction. Okay, very important muscle system. So get that into your head because that's really, really important when you're thinking about firing up the glutes to get hip stability. 
It's not just about the glutes, it's about the whole package together and usually co-contracting. So activation first. Now, you know, activating lazy glutes is tough, but always close chain, then open chain, okay? So, and you need your core. If you do not have core stability, you won't get your glutes, you won't get your hip stability. Um, and you need to work on your, on your mobility. I always like to think of, it's pretty hard to get a strong, stable hip, okay, if you've got all these mobility issues. So get sorted, get sorted on that. Use your bands, do your stretches, work on that stuff. The activation is really important, and then you need to work on lateral resistance rather than loading the joint. Okay, lateral resistance rather than loading the joint. Work on external internal rotation stuff, because yeah, that's what they do, external internal rotators, right, abductors, rather than you jumping up and down on it. Okay, um, so your selection process, activation, glute leg lift, which is prone, clench your buttock, raise your leg, that stuff. Okay, but they've got to actually work on activation. So they've got to go, and you'll see this, people go to raise their leg and their bum's doing nothing. Okay, they're just doing hip extension, which is, you know, hamstring spine, that's what they do, they do hip extension, but you need to be doing clenching the buttock first and then raising, and practicing that thousands of times to get that permanently burned in their brain. Um, clams is external rotation, four point hip extension, which is this one, so coming into here, doing that work. Okay, and all the stuff you've done before, but you've got to realise why you're doing it and how many times you've got to be doing it. Okay, and these are great exercises to get that hip fired up and working and activating, so then you can get it stronger and you can get the joint more stable. Bridges, we've all heard of bridges, but they're next. Okay, bridges, you need to do these for hip stability. All right? But when you think of bridges, okay, that's working glute max, it's also working everything else as well. All right? It's not remember when you do these exercises, oh I'm working on glute max, that's doing the primary movement, but what's stabilizing the joint underneath that when you go into hip extension? Or the others. So then how do I get all the others working as well? Well, throw a band around your knees. Why do people throw bands round here? to fire up their lateral rotators and get more lateral rotation resistance work done when they go into hip extension. And that is good for, so when I squat, my knees don't roll in. When I go into from flexion to extension, I want my lateral rotators strong. Now, if I'm not so good in this position because I don't know how to squat, then they need to do bridges. So it's a low level exercise. You, you, you're back at you know, square one. But then you progress at bridges. Normal ones, on the band, on the ball, make it harder, single leg, okay, make it harder, work on one side more than the other, single leg with the band, you know, single leg band with the ball, before you start progressing on. So exhaust the exercise with difficulty in bands and balls and stability before you start moving on. Physio lunges, you should all have physio lunges, go to our website, have a look at those. Physio lunges with a band, there's a new one up there, which I'll show you in a minute. Single leg step down, and then scare squat. So that's working on their stability here, okay, making sure they, you know, are working on that sort of stuff. Um, single leg deadlifts, that's how the progression should be for you in that order. And doing one leg ball squat. The one leg ball squat, there's a great video on our website, so I've got it in red. Check that out. That is doing a one leg squat with a ball here. Okay, and pushing into that ball, yeah? So you're actually working isometric work here, isometric work here, to try and create more strength in those muscles while I squat, okay? And it's great to do one side over the other, all right? Whereas band work here is uh, both sides at the same time, whereas a ball squat you can work on one, if one is weaker. And lastly, your knee. Now, Knee, I um, have to finish up here, but knee stuff, you've got to think about the knee joint and the form closure, okay? If you've got a torn meniscus, or if you've got a bit of meniscus removed, you don't have as much integrity in there. If you've got a torn ligament, you've got a loose knee, you've got a weak VMO that is not tracking the patella correctly, that's instability, okay? So you've got instability of the joints, you've got inst of the knee joint, instability of the patellofemoral joint. Um, and remember what the role of the VMO is. It's patellofemoral joint stability. It's not whether that controls, like having a strong VMO doesn't 
control this movement. Okay, so if you see someone going, oh, your knee's rolling, you need to work on your VMO. No, you don't. You need to work up here. Because that movement here is coming from here, and maybe your foot. But your VMO controls your patella and your gliding of what's happening with your patella in the knee. And it is just as important. Okay, but don't get confused between the two. Um, and, you know, and getting a stable knee is the co-contraction of the quads and the hamstrings together. Okay, and yep. Okay, everything that hooks into the knee, creating that closure and that stability. Um, going into an internal rotation valgus stress position is an unstable position. Okay, now we can do that with our body weight, like I said before, you can do this sort of thing, but under load with 100 kilos is not cool. Okay, so you've got to stay away from that unstable positions. And that's why we have an ACL to prevent us going into that anteromedial movement, right? Going too far, controls that movement. Um, and correct foot positioning, okay? Making sure you've got that, you know, your feet, and you work on the external rotation to keep in your feet alignment, right? I saw a video on YouTube the other day, and this person was saying that having an internal rotation of the foot was better, you know? No, it's not, it's worse. Creates more instability here. So some people have got, you know, they need to review the anatomy a little bit. Have a look at that. So there's your VMO here. Okay, so you may just kind of control what that knee is doing, kneecap is doing here. You can imagine if you lose some of the cartilage here through age or wear and tear, if you bust your ACL, if you tear your meniscus, all these things create stability for the joint. And if they've got a client that has had problems with this or has got problems with it, they're going to have less stability. You need to work on their stability with exercises to improve that so that they don't get injured. Because you're not going to just put a new meniscus in there. Right? You need to make up for that. All right? So even if they're strong, they still need to work on stability work because they're making up a deficit of what's happening in another part of the joint. So last but not least... There's your rehab selection process. Again, activation first. You know, if their VMO is rubbish and not doing much, they need to work on the activation work. VMO squeezes, that sort of thing. Okay, over the towel, getting that going. Really boring stuff, but stuff we do even post-surgery. Okay, and it not, might not necessarily be the first point of choice for you, but if they've got a lazy VMO, they're going to have to do some of that. Um, then working on lunges, step downs, scare squats, single legs, so similar exercises to the hip, very, very similar. Okay, we do a lot of hip exercises and knee exercises together. All right. Um, again, check out our website. These exercises are on there with instructions of what to do so you guys can learn that stuff. All right. And those are progressions, making something more unstable, putting a BOSU under their foot. If they're really stable, single leg, put a BOSU under there to make it more unstable, so it challenges their stability. It challenges those muscles to re-stabilize and work harder, so you're getting their stability function better, not just necessarily how much load they can handle going downwards. So when you progress an exercise for stability, don't think I need more load. I need to create an unstable surface or I need lateral resistance to generate what, more of that activation of what that muscle is doing. Okay, um, and that's it. Any questions on that? We're all good. Yep. I got one question. Um, backing up to the belt uh, idea. Yep. How much load do you have to have, or your experience, before uh, a core can kind of support the weight? Guys, just around the sport, for example. It's different for every person. But then, how much like would be a safe kind of uh, guidance you can have? Like, well, anything over your body weight, you need to be amazing. And if you're not amazing, you'll, you'll be making up for it. Huh? Say it again. No. No. I mean, there'll be a point, and that's different for everybody, because other people are stronger than other people. You know, so it is all relative. But you'll see there'll be a load thing, and whenever someone gets up, especially in, like, Olympic stuff, they're all wearing weight belts because they're all, their load is you know, twice their body weight sort of thing. Okay? Whether, what that level is, it's hard to say.
okay? But, you know, if it's under your body weight and you're wearing a weight belt, then you're, there's something going wrong. Yep, for sure. All right. Now, you guys need, um, if you put your, haven't put your name down, put your name down, um, and I'll email you the new PowerPoint, and also let you know when we've got workshops coming up. Okay, thanks very much.